Hi everybody, I am Vachavor Perion. Welcome to my first course, How to Solve Circuits the Right Way, Once and for All. I would like to call it the joys of circuit analysis, because I believe you will indeed find it to be a joyful experience learning all about the techniques that I'm going to teach you in this course. These lectures are based on my book, Fast Analytical Techniques in Electrical and Electronic Circuits, published by Cambridge University Press and is available online from any bookseller. Lecture one comprises five videos covering the following topics, meaningful and meaningless solutions to circuits, painful circuit analysis, painless and joyful circuit analysis, excruciating circuit analysis, something that you do not want to do, but unfortunately, that is all that you've learned in a school. To alleviate this pain, I will present you with more joyful circuit analysis. And finally, I will pay tribute to my late professor, Dr. David Middlebrook at Caltech, who pioneered the techniques in this course, which he called design-oriented analysis. It is imperative that we begin this course by an understanding and appreciation of what is meant by meaningful and meaningless expressions. With that, we start with a simple example of a resistive circuit where we're asked to determine the input resistance Rn. We see that Rn comprises the series combination of R1 and R2 in parallel with R3 plus R4. So we write that down. Rn equals R1 plus R2 in parallel with R3 plus R4. Now, this is a meaningful solution to the input resistance Rn because it is an analytical expression in which the circuit elements are grouped together in series and parallel combinations which mirror the physical circuit. It is also meaningful because it gives you an idea what the circuit looks like even if you did not see the circuit, so to say. Now, when I look at this expression, I have a pretty good idea what is going on inside it, how the various elements are interconnected, and how they contribute to Rn. Now you know that you are going to be working with circuits that are more complicated than, we just, than the one we just saw. And therefore they're going to have more complicated expression for their input resistance, output resistance, a voltage gain, a current gain, or what have you. Now, if in those expressions the circuit elements are not grouped together in such meaningful fashion, then you're going to have a very hard time trying to figure out how those elements are contributing to that transfer function. To illustrate this point, I'm going to show you an example of the gain of a non-ideal inverting op-amp a little later on. Here is now a meaningless but nevertheless correct solution to the input resistance of the same circuit. It is given by this expression. When I look at it, I have absolutely no idea as to what is going on inside the circuit as far as these elements are concerned. To make the point, I'll take the circuit away. When you look at this expressions, do you have any idea what is going on inside that circuit? I don't think so. Nevertheless, this is a correct expression. In fact, if you wanted to numerically evaluate the input resistance, this would be one such expression to use. Outside of that, it has no utility. It is meaningless because the grouping of the resistors in this expression say nothing about the structure of the circuit. If you don't see the circuit, you have no clue what is going on inside it. It is also meaningless because this expression cannot be approximated easily or readily. For example, if R4 is much larger than R3, or R4 is much larger than R3 and R2, if you want to approximate this expression with these inequalities, then you're going to have to do some work to reduce this expression to its approximate form. When the expression is meaningful rather than meaningless like this, it approximates readily, as we will show you in the next two slides. This meaningless answer is the result of painful circuit analysis, which is the only kind of circuit analysis that you have studied, or you are studying right now, 
and worse, you are teaching it to some undergraduate. We are now going to compare the process of approximation in each of these meaningful and meaningless expressions. We start with the meaningful expression and approximate it for R4 much larger than R3 and R4 much larger than R3 and R2. And here's that meaningful expression in which we see that if R4 is much larger than R3, then quite obviously we have the following approximation. You simply throw R3 with respect to R4 and you get your first approximation. R in is approximately equal to R1 plus R2 parallel R4. Now, if we want to approximate this further for R4 much larger than R2, then we recognize that in a parallel combination, the smaller of two resistors dominate. Therefore, continuing from this approximation with R2 much less than R4, then we have Rn reduces to R1 plus R2. And we're done. We are now going to approximate the meaningless expression for R4 much larger than R3 and R4 much larger than R3 and R2. And here's that meaningless expression. When I look at the denominator, it's quite easy. If R3 is much less than R4, I can throw it away. But when I look at the numerator, I can't do that readily. And I have to do some factoring like this, R3 into R1 plus R2 and R4 into R1 plus R2 so that I can factor one more time R1 plus R2 into R3 plus R4. Now I can see R3 is much less than R4, so I can throw that away here and in the denominator here, and it reduces to my first approximation. However, my first approximation is also a meaningless expression, and I cannot make much sense out of it. And if I want to get some sense out of it, I have to do some more algebraic push-ups. I refactor the numerator as R1 into R2 plus R4 plus R2 times R4, so that I recognize now I can divide R2 plus R4 and obtain R1 in plus R2 times R4 divided by R2 plus R4, which I recognize to be a parallel combination of R2 and R4. Now, this is an awful lot of algebra just to get to the first approximation that makes sense. And that's painful. And the whole point of this course is to have you avoid this kind of long algebra, to get meaningful analytical answers easily, painlessly, and approximate them painlessly. Now we ask ourselves, where did that meaningless solution come from? To be perfectly honest, for a simple circuit like this, when you're asked to determine the input resistance, you don't even have to perform any analysis. You just look at it and you say it's R1 plus R2 in parallel with R3 plus R4. But if the circuit was more complicated, then you would have had no choice but to write the nodal equations. That is to say, until you've learned the techniques that I'm going to teach you in this course. If we write the nodal equations for the circuit, this is what we obtain. We connect the test current source at the input and we determine the voltage V1. We write the nodal equations at V1 and V2. At V2, the sum of the currents entering that node must be equal to zero. Same thing for V1. At V2, we use superposition and we say that the current going into V2 is V1 divided by R1 when V2 equals to zero. And then when V1 equals to zero, the currents going out this way, this way, and that way are respectively V2 over R1, V2 over R2, and V2 over R3 plus R4. And that's this term here. Their sum equals to zero. That's your first nodal equation. Same thing applies to V1, except it seems to be a little easier. There's a current I going in, and then there's a current flowing due to V2 while V1 is zero going this way. It's V2 over R1, and there's a current going out that way. When V2 equals to zero, and that is V1 over R1, and we get the second nodal equation. So we get, in the end, two nodal equations that we have, and we want to solve for V1 over I to determine the input resistance. How do we do that? Well, good old Kramer's rule. And here it is. It is this term divided by this determinant. And out comes the answer 
are in. It is the meaningless answer that we presented. And that is exactly how stuff happens. I am going to show you in this course that you will never ever have to write another nodal or loop equation again, no matter how complicated the circuit gets. You are going to learn how to break a complicated circuit into a number of smaller circuits, which are very simple and which you can analyze almost by inspection or by a line or two of algebra. Then you're going to learn how to assemble the final solution of the full circuit from the individual solutions that you obtain from these simple circuits. In that way, the solution that you will obtain will be a meaningful answer as you will see throughout the coming lectures. But before we do that, I want to compare some other expressions which are meaningful and meaningless. Here is a meaningless expression of the voltage gain of a non-ideal inverting amplifier. I have seen this expression in textbooks, application notes, and in engineering handbooks. When I look at this expression here, I have absolutely no idea as to how the non-ideal components R0, A0, and Rn contribute to the inverting gain, or rather contribute to the deterioration of the inverting gain. Now let us compare the same expression of the voltage gain obtained in meaningful form. Here it is. Up front, I have the ideal inverting gain minus R2 over R1, R2 over R1 which you are all familiar with as the inverting gain of an ideal op-amp circuit. That appears up front. It is followed by what appears to be a correction factor, which contains the non-ideal components R0, A0, R0, and Rn, along with the rest of the circuit elements. So I can see I have my ideal gain followed by a correction factor which seems to reduce the value of the ideal closed loop gain because the numerator is less than one and the denominator is slightly larger than one. So it is slightly off. That tells me a lot as to what is going on inside the circuit, as to who are the dominant elements in the voltage gain of the circuit and which are the non-dominant elements and what is the extent of their contribution to the deterioration of this gain. Well, let us take a look at A0. Now, if A0 is infinite, as in the case of an ideal op-amp, you see that this whole term drops out and this entire term drops out and I recover my ideal closed loop gain, even though R0 and Rn may very well be inside that circuit. All you really need is for the voltage gain of that amplifier to be infinite and it doesn't matter if R0 is finite as well as if Rn is finite. It acts like an ideal op-amp circuit. If I want to approximate this expression for finite gain, then I can easily do so because I have now ratios that are compared to unity here, here, and here. And I can approximate them to whatever degree I want. The expression R2 plus RL parallel R0, that can be easily approximated. R0 much less than RL, you can throw away RL. So you can see very clearly that a meaningful expression conveys a lot more information as to what is going on inside the circuit and it is readily available for approximations. Without much work, just one look, you see one element dominating, the turn drops out. It approximates very easily. And that's the value of this kind of analysis that I'm going to teach you in this course. Using a simple bridge circuit, I'm going to demonstrate again what is meant by painful nodal analysis. In this example, we're asked to determine the input resistance of the resistive bridge circuit shown. Since Rn is not obvious and cannot be written as easily as in the first example, you're inclined to use the only circuit analysis technique that you know, which is nodal analysis. 
And that's what we are going to do in the next few slides and see what kind of an answer we get. We identify the three independent nodes, V1, V2, V3, and we write the nodal equation at each node. At V1, we have the following equation. At V2, we have the second equation, and at V3, we have the third one. These three simultaneous equations together constitute the following matrix equation. Notice that I'm using conductances instead of resistances, because conductances are more amenable to nodal analysis. Now that we have this matrix equation, how do we solve for it? Well, we apply Cramer's rule so that we can determine the ratio of V1 to I, which is the input resistance of this circuit. When we apply Cramer's rule, we obtain the following result for the input resistance. And it turns out to be ratio of two determinants. Clearly, if you're expecting to obtain a meaningful answer for Rn, expanding these two determinants is not going to result in such a meaningful expression. It's going to be an awful lot of work expanding these two determinants, and at the very end, you're going to get one big meaningless answer. Expanding determinants is not fun, especially when you're expanding determinants in analytical form, not numerically. Numerically, you don't even have to do it. Today, the computer will do that for you. You don't have to bother. And this is how you get a meaningless solution. And this is what I call painful analysis. It is what you've learned in school, or it is what you're learning right now. And worst of all, it is probably what you're teaching to an undergraduate. And that is how stuff happens. You need therapy. You need therapy to alleviate this pain. You need painless circuit analysis. You need to learn about the joys of circuit analysis. You need to listen to what I have to say in the next example. You need to listen to all my lectures. Well then, go to my next video so that I'll show you how you can solve that bridge circuit in the least amount of algebra that you can possibly imagine. Thank you.